Hello everyone, uh, this is iBlock TV, my name is Michael and we are here on the Malta AI and Blockchain Summit. I'm here with uh, Jose Maria Macedo, he's the uh, head of advisory and uh, tokenomics architect at uh, Amazing. This is a company that uh, has a, offers a full service for uh, crowdfunding if via the vehicles of ICOs and STOs and did a pretty good job in the past. They raised for their clients more than $1 billion. So, Jose, what I would like to discuss with you today is um, a few things. So, what's, what's your opinion? What are the most important steps for startups? Uh, in order to do a successful uh, crowdfunding and how do you see that the market changed now in this 2019? But first, uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and about the company. Yep, so my background uh, is actually pretty strange uh, as we'll I think get into later. I used to be a professional poker player. Um, I was one of the best in, in, in Europe in, in sort of six max poker. And then uh, I stopped playing that, went, went to university where I studied philosophy and economics. Um, there I started quite a few businesses. Um, I had a successful exit, so uh, after university I didn't really have to go get a job. I had these businesses I was running, but at that point someone introduced me to Ethereum um, and I sort of fell down the Ethereum rabbit hole, started reading everything about it, and um, since then I've just been sort of into that. I started working with, with Amazix around a year and a half ago. Um, and basically, yeah, as you said, Amazix, I'm the head of advisory, so I handle all the tokenomics, all the white paper writing, document creation, all that kind of stuff. And what we do at Amazix is we, we help with every aspect of the token sale. Um, so we've worked, as you mentioned, with 120 projects, raising 1.3 billion. And we help with everything from legal, uh, structuring, tokenomics, to the marketing and PR, to the corporate finance, speaking to investors and stuff like that. Um, and then we also have some services that we help with after the sale, like transparency, ongoing transparency with investors and stuff like that so uh, you have a uh, pretty much a lot of experience so what do you think uh, if you would consult uh, a startup what do you think are the most important steps that a startup has to do in order to 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 do uh, successfully a crowdfunding yeah I mean I think most startups that come to us, they ask us for help to find investors or to, to do marketing. And what we have to tell them always is, that's like step three. You have to start at the beginning. You have to do the preparation first. So um, for us, the mo most important preparation is we, we look at the company, we look at what they're doing uh, deeply, and, and, and we sort of think, who is the right investor for this? Um, and we, we're not, it's not an average investor, because the average investor doesn't exist in our mind. It's actually, who are all the specific groups of investors that will invest in this? Is it private equity firms? Is it sovereign wealth? funds? Is it venture capitalists? If venture capitalists, which venture capitalists? Um, in, in, w within retail investors, what kind of retail investors? You know, um, Where can we find these retail investors? What kind of people are there? So j just defining like all the different investor groups that, that could, inv could possibly invest in this um, and, and what their characteristics are. From there, we go, okay, what's the story that we should tell these investors? You know, So what is the narrative that each of these investors wants to invest in? For instance, um, a venture capital fund wants incentives same growth, right? They're looking for the 10,000x returns. Um, a family office will have very different characteristics. They, they, they might be more interested in a stable investment. Um, they might have problems custodying the asset. So what, what we look at then is what should the narrative be for each of those investors? And that goes for everything from the documentation, so how you talk about your project. If you're pitching to a, to a blockchain um, fund, then you can mention, you can go very deep into the blockchain technology. If you're pitching to a normal venture capital fund, then the blockchain technology should be sort of absolutely Extracted, and it should just be a way that you achieve a certain goal, right? So it depends. It always depends, sort of, who you're talking to, and we try and we, we try and tailor the narrative to whoever it is you're talking to, and then sort of our four teams work. So we have four departments: corporate finance, um, le tax and legal, advisory, and PR and marketing, and. Um, we sort of work together to define those narratives. And the narrative covers everything, yeah. So where you're structured, um, how you speak about yourself, all that kind of stuff. And then once we've defined the narratives, then we go to the actual marketing and, and sales because it's like anything else, you know, when, when you're marketing, you need to have a message that, that makes sense and that's gonna convert highly. Otherwise, you're throwing money, um, you know, you're throwing money at an empty, at a hole, like a black hole that just sucks your money in. So you wanna make sure that, that you've optimized your message so that you can actually, once the message message reaches the investors, it has a high conversion rate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, and uh, if you, if a, 
startup is preparing the crowdfunding. So what do you think, which services have to be done really professionally? Well, I'd say most of it has to be done uh, very professionally if you're preparing a crowdfunding, especially nowadays. Um, the legal is very important. So where you set up, I mean, it's important that you set up in a jurisdiction that the investors that you're targeting are comfortable with, you know, because everyone right now is targeting institutional investors. That's something to remember, you know, because ICOs, um, even ICOs need to target institutional investors because there's not enough liquidity in retail right now and also institutionals drive the narrative. So if you get a big institutional name on, it's much easier to then do the ICO. So you need to really set up in a, in a, in a, in a jurisdiction that the investors that, that you're targeting are comfortable with. So legal is one of it. And then the, the PR and marketing, obviously, depending if you're doing an ICO or an STO, it needs to be compliant. It needs to follow certain guidelines. You, you, there's certain things you cannot say. You cannot do the when moon graphs, you know, the, the, the graph going up of, of predicted token price, you know. So you, you have to be careful with your PR and marketing and it, it has to be effective still. So it has to be done professionally. There can't be uh, mistakes on it, all that kind of thing. Token economics is super important, something that was completely um, forgotten during sort of the, the ICO boom, you know, that people just assume that because there's a token in this ecosystem, it's going to accrue value, but the mechanism by which a token actually accrues value is super important. That's something I work on a lot. You know, um, medium of exchange tokens, very hard for them to accrue value. You need to really design something that has some sort of capital-like characteristics, some sort of cash flow, um, and those are the most interesting models. And then, um, of course, the corporate finance, the way you approach investors, um, having a complete data room with all the documents they need so they don't, don't have to go searching around, having the network with the right investors so, so that you can get straight in and, and, and send your pitch deck to the right partner within that investment fund. So I think sort of the whole thing needs to be done uh, professionally nowadays. You know, I think gone are the days of just launching a white paper and, and hoping for the best. Speaking of past, so um, last year there was a total breakdown of the whole ICO hype. So how do you see that the market changed now? So what is important now that was not important before? And how do you adapt to it? Yeah, the market's changed a lot. I mean, um, we've seen obviously a huge shift to STOs um, because most of the ICOs were actually STOs anyway. You know, they were illegal securities offerings um, in that people were just raising money with, with, with a tool that was basically security and, and not declaring it as such. So now what we're seeing is actual securities offerings. So people going through the steps of registering with the local financial authority, issuing a prospectus in the case that they're targeting investors or, or a PPM if they're not targeting um, retail investors and, and doing all the transparency steps or so committing to being audited yearly and all these are positive things for the market you know most of the ICOs should have been should have been STOs but that's not the case with all of them so I think a lot of people have thrown out the, the baby with the bathwater with, with ICOs and ICOs there's still like a legit use case for ICOs there's there, there's certain use cases that could not be done without without a utility token you know a utility token is super useful to bootstrap the supply side of these networks like we've done with Ethereum like we've done with Augur these projects so I think the market has changed in that the average quality is much higher. So the projects that come to us nowadays are much higher quality than the ones that we had in 2017. Um, there's really interesting stuff being built and there's also a lot of traction happening. You know, you look at sound money, Bitcoin transacted 3.5 trillion last year, you know. PayPal did 600 billion. Visa and MasterCard did more, but they've had 30 years lead on Bitcoin. You look at Open Finance, MakerDAO, 300 million worth of loans, you know. There's 500 million worth of Ethereum locked up in MakerDAO. Um, volume, transaction volumes are up on all the decentralized exchanges as well. AirSwap's doing much better than it was before. Um, Web3 is getting some traction as well. So I think it's all sort of happening and, and the, way, the way it works is that you need to, you know, there's protocol layer, infrastructure and then applications, you know. And, and and I think we're still very much building out that protocol and infrastructure layer. So it's normal that we don't have sort of that many user-facing applications yet. Um, but I think that'll be something that we'll see more and more of over the next five years. Um, and that's when it gets really interesting and where you're going to see the really quality teams executing on marketing, executing on UI, building on top of these protocols that we've built over the last few years. Thank you. So. Um well, how could you explain, let's say, tokenomics in, in, on a high level for our viewers? What, what it is and why it is important? Cool, yeah. I'd say tokenomics is basically the study of how a token becomes valuable. Um, so you can think of it as like corporate finance for, for tokens. So it's like um, 
you know, what is the use of this token in the ecosystem and how valuable could it be given different assumptions for ecosystem success? Because what, what you have is, for instance, if you have a marketplace and you have a medium of exchange token, so I have a marketplace like uh, decentralized Uber or whatever, and my token model is uh, you have to use my token to pay for the Uber drivers. What we've seen with those token models is that the velocity is super high, so those tokens never accrue value, right? Because the value of anything is the amount of value stored in it at any given time. If you have a constant velocity loop where people buy the token to pay for the Uber, and then the Uber driver sells the token to pay for his bills, and, and, and there's no reason for anyone to hold the token. So the velocity is super high, right? So what you see is there needs to be a reason to hold the token, and normally um, either you're a store of value, like Bitcoin, which is an incredibly difficult thing to compete with. Bitcoin, gold, these things that people don't mind storing their value in because they have some, some belief in it, in its characteristics of store of value. But that's kind of a category that you really have to have some, some big innovation to, to be able to beat Bitcoin, Monero, etc. on. Or you need to have, you need to be what I call crypto capital. So you need to have some sort of value flow or cash flow that accrues to the token. So for example, Augur, right? You, you can stake tokens in order to become a validator on the network uh, and, and uh, resolve prediction markets or steam it. Um, is another example. Everpedia, who's here, is another great example of a good token model. So I think the token economics is basically studying, yeah, why will this, like, if the ecosystem's successful, will this token actually be valuable? Because it's not a given, right? Just because I issue a token uh, and I have a business doesn't mean that token will be correlated to the business at all. So, yeah, the, it's the study of why will this thing be valuable and how valuable will it be given, um, given different assumptions for ecosystem success. And, of course, it's still a young field, you know? When you look at uh, financial markets, they've existed since the 1600s, and the discounted cash flow methodology, which is like the golden standard of how we value uh, equities, came about in 1937. You know, it took 300 and something years for that to come about. So we've had 10 years, but really four years of token economics, because, uh, you know, Ethereum was what really launched the, the token economics. So it's normal that we don't yet have established valuation methodologies for these things. But the idea that because we don't have an established valuation methodology, they must be valueless, is just false, right? I mean, um, of, of course these things have value. They serve a purpose in the ecosystem. Um, the difficulty is that we, we don't, and the methods are getting much better, by the way. Uh, we, we have stuff a, a year now that we didn't have a year ago that's much better. Um, but I think it'll keep evolving and, and we'll, in a few years, uh, well, hopefully in 10 years, we'll have the equivalent of a gold standard of the, like the DCF to value these things and we understand how they work. But it's going to be a lot of failed experiments before then and a lot of like, yeah, that kind of thing. So. Thank you, that was very insightful. And um, so you were a professional poker player in very early age. Yeah. So uh, you started with 16 and with 19 you already earned like 1.5 million with yeah. poker. So tell us, how uh, did this experience for professional poker playing, how does it help you maybe with uh, tokenomics or with your uh, activities as advisor? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it pretty much shaped the whole way I think about the world because it was such such an early age that I mean, in a, in in poker you you learn to think in terms of expected value, which means that um, just because something happens infrequently doesn't mean it's not a worthwhile investment as long as the payoff is huge when it happens, which for me is the definition of crypto, right? Crypto is, when I, especially my sort of probability I'm assigning to it is going up the more time I spend in it. But when I first started in crypto, my, my logic was, um, I think this thing has a very low chance of being successful, but if it is successful, it's sort of a tens of trillions opportunity. So the payoff's so huge that on an adjusted expected value basis, it's, it, it's a good investment, right? And um, I look at sort of everything that way, you know, almost to, to sort of a neurotic level because, because of poker. But, you, you can add, it's, a, it's a very useful framework to make decisions because you can sort of think of um, the probabilities and the magnitude of those probabilities and then assess them that way, which is sort of a very rational way to make decisions. And then, of course, um, poker is all about game theory. You know, it, it's about strategy. So um, it's about sort of, I mean, picking the strategy that, that, that exploits your opponent and understanding when you're being exploited. Um, and also lo loads of interesting co concepts like being game theory optimal where you're unexploitable but you can exploit your opponent and all that stuff's super useful for crypto because like, I feel like when I read the Bitcoin white paper I had sort of an instant appreciation of it because of my background playing poker. And then, you know, of course, uh, helps for investment as well. You have to be very disciplined. Um, yeah, it was a really good school for me for, for the rest of my, the rest of the stuff I did afterwards, definitely. I mean, I, I recommend it to everyone. If, you're, if you've got the discipline uh, for it, it's a good game.
Okay, so it's a good decision to start with poker in the early age. <laughs> okay, Jose, thank you very much. This was very informative. Thank you. Uh, this is iBlock TV. My name is Michael, and I was here with Jose Maria Macedo from Amazix. Thank you very much, and all the best.